Apologies from Victoria McFarlane Reed, um, Rachel Mitchison, and Hilary Snowden. Uh, shall I propose the minutes attached here as a true record of last meeting on 10th of August, 2023? Is that okay? Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Any disclosures of interest? I think we had one from uh, Peter Stanfield. I'd like to hear, I think, yeah, because he thinks there might be some conflict. Peter Stanfield. So I have... Uh declared a potential perceptible uh, conflict of interest uh, as I am employed by uh, Abbeyfield Newcastle, soon to be Abbeyfield Northumbria, a provider of uh, sh uh, a residential and sheltered accommodation for the elderly. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <coughs> so no other disclosures of interest, I take it. Thank you. So let's move on to the first major item. Uh, North Miller, North Tyneside Community Infection Prevention Control Strategy 23 to 28. I think, Veronica, you are going to introduce uh, uh, the report a little bit, followed by Thank you. Dr. Just Jim Brown's um, report. Yeah. It'll just be a few words. Um, I'd like to introduce the new Community Infection Prevention and Control Strategy for Northumberland and North Tyneside. This has been a col collaboration between many of our local agencies. Um, Northumberland and North Tyneside Councils, Northumbria Healthcare Trust, the North East and North Cumbria Integrated Care Boards place, sorry, I get that around the other, I knew I'd get that one wrong. The, the place teams, uh, the Northumberland and North Tyneside place teams for the Integrated Care Board, uh, the UK's Health Security Agency's North East Health Protection Team and the Northumberland Local Medical Council and Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir found, uh, NHS Foundation Trust, who are all working together as a whole system to implement infection prevention and control measures in community settings. IPC is all about using practical, evidence-based approaches to prevent patients, residents, visitors and staff from being harmed by avoidable infections. The COVID pandemic reinforced the importance of having effective um, prevention control measures in community settings. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Jim Brown, consultant in public health, and Heather Lawson, the senior IPC nurse, who are going to present the strategy. And we would like to recommend that the Health and Wellbeing Board accepts the new uh, Northumberland and North Tyneside community IPC strategy and approves the goals and actions agreed to achieve those goals. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for your time on, on the agenda today. Um, you'll see it's, uh, there's two things I want to point out from the, uh, from the, uh, the title slide. It's Northumberland and North Tyneside, and that's really because we have a, an IPC team that crosses across, uh, across both of those local authority areas. And so it made absolute sense to be working together. And I think that's in the kind of zeitgeist of really of, of collaboration going forward. And it's community. So we're not focused on the acute sector on hospital IPC. It's really where actually a whole system partnership approach really comes into its own in the community. So the aims, uh, I think they're fairly straightforward, just to well, prevent incidents, outbreaks of harm from infection, community settings across our areas through effective IPC interventions, but also really to make sure that we're as prepared as we can be for any new emerging developing threats, future pandemics. It's really timely, actually. There's nothing like timeliness in public health to, 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 you know, to, to make sure the messages get through, if I'm honest. Um, I think, you know, we've seen, obviously, the, uh, a new variant, uh, BA.2.86, otherwise sometimes known as Perola. We've seen the number of cases, particularly in a care home, a big outbreak in the east of England. Not necessarily that we think it's likely to be a more severe variant, but certainly some possibility that it's evading our immunity and, uh, and vaccination more effectively. Uh, and it has meant that we've brought forward the vaccination programme back to its original start date of this week, and I think that's already, already kicked off uh, Obviously, avian flu is not uh, thought to be high risk. It's a low risk, but it's just another reminder of kind of ongoing threats. And we still have much of our bird population up the Northumberland coast affected. It's closed the farms. Uh, you know, there are, there are issues, there are threats. 
And something I just really wanted to come back down to was, was just what the government said about what was a risk of pandemic. And I think you may have seen, if, unless you're on your holidays and hopefully turned your, your phone off, uh, that the risk register nationally um, suggested that there was a sort of 5 to 25 percent chance of a pandemic in the next five years. That's not insignificant. Um, and I think what's really key, if you look at into, up at this slide, I mean, on the left is the, the likelihood along the, you know, the bottom x-axis, but up on the y-axis is actually what the impact. And I think of all the risks, and there's many of them that the government identified, really the risk of pandemic is probably the highest when you combine the impact and likelihood. So I think it, without trying to be apocalyptic, uh, I think it's kind of, it's just about us being as prepared as we can be and making sure that we build on the learning from COVID as much as we can. So I think the objectives I'm hoping are fairly straightforward. They're the kind of things you hope you normally expect to see in a strategy. Where are we now? So a bit of a review of you know, what are our current activities, what's current IPC provision, and uh, we'll talk about the team in a moment. Uh, you know, what are the kind of behaviours and what are the needs? What's current guidance, best practice? And then to really then move on to you know, where do we want to get to? What are the goals we want to achieve? What are we going to need for that? What are the types of approaches? How are we going to uh, get there? How, we, how will we know we've got there and, and, and arrived? So I think um, it's fairly straightforward, and I hope that, that that's clear in the, in the report. This is the kind of scale of the challenge, the scope when we talked about community. We limited it to the care sector, so care homes, the 99 care homes in Northumberland, and obviously all the others in North Tyneside as well. Um, domiciliary care. It's a large number of providers and an awful lot of independent supported living settings in Northumberland as well. Education is also a huge number of providers, actually not only of the schools, but actually all of the early year settings, which to be fair, we didn't hear from as part of this strategy. So one of the goals is really, and one of, one of the actions we're going to take is just to undertake a bit of work with early year settings to understand how best to support them. But it's also general practice, and it's also the, our five children's residential homes in, North, in Northumberland. And there was representation from across each of these areas. So the methods we took, we had, uh, as Councillor Jones has said, actually a, a, a steering group, strategy group that was broad. I think demonstrated a really good collaboration across different sectors. We reviewed current guidance, best practice did a literature on the barriers and facilitators to IPC. I think that's really important. So it's not really just about what should we do, but understanding you know, what are the reasons people do or don't manage to implement some of those behaviours and what are the kind of interventions we can use to promote those, those, uh, that, that best practice. We did some surveys of, of our, some of our different settings, the ones that I've just talked about. We undertook a couple of stakeholder focus groups, which were really useful. And then we just pulled in some of that data from existing, uh, you know, previous surveys and audits and, and the visits, the many visits that, uh, that went, went on during COVID and uh, before and after. Or well, during the height of COVID, I should say, shouldn't I? Um, and then we did a bit of a prioritisation exercise, just bearing in mind, as you'll see, the kind of limited... Uh, resource that the IPC team is just to think about well how, how can we prioritize going forward so I'm going to hand over to Heather now and then you're going to we're going to yo-yo a little bit uh, through just to get a different voice I'm sorry thanks Jim so like Jim's mentioned the IPC team within Northumbria Healthcare they do work across both Northumberland and North Tyneside and one of the main aims of the strategy was to create parity across those areas. And at the moment, although we have quite a large team with 10.1 whole time equivalents, in reality, there's 4.8 whole time equivalent staff providing community cover for IPC across Northumberland and North Tyneside, which is a huge undertaking if you think back to all the areas that we're currently covering just in Northumberland alone, let alone North Tyneside. And we've always had a good relationship with care homes, particularly in Northumberland, where we've engaged with training and advice and support. And we've worked collaboratively with the council and with UK Health Support um, Security Agency. But since 2020, since the, since the pandemic really started to hold its grip, we've supported a lot more care homes. So we've supported in excess of 700 COVID outbreaks. And what's that, what that's involved is us providing support, advice, going out to care homes, doing thorough 
in-depth investigations, visits, <coughs> looking to see if there's any ways in which we can mitigate against spread of infection across these settings where there's particularly vulnerable individuals of community in those homes and giving them as much support as possible. The main day-to-day -day activities for IPC is mainly around training and the main focus of our community role is as much about preventing as it is about controlling infection. So a lot of our work is proactive rather than reactive. So we do a lot of education and training, particularly with care homes. We do provide occasional training to GP practices, but we do tend to charge for that. So it's not something that is widely taken up, but we do a lot of education and training. We do a lot of direct support, so outbreak management, particularly within our intermediate care units. The main one being in Northumberland is it um, the Bluebell unit in Morper. And we do a lot of visits with care homes, looking at audit practices, assisting with the commissioning services in terms of quality monitoring visits, and also providing support for those people who are going into care homes or domiciliary care. We have also, over the pandemic, um, provided fit testing for those care staff working in adult social care. So making sure that our adult social care staff are as prepared as possible to protect not just themselves, but protect the patients or residents that they're looking after. And like I say, the main push of the strategy is all about collaborative work. And so working together for the greater good, working with Northumberland, North Tyneside, UXA, the ICB, PLACE, all of those services that feed into community settings working together to try and achieve a strategy that is meaningful and is effective. I've mentioned audit. Um, certainly from an audit point of view, we do a lot of work with GP practice and primary care, particularly around um, healthcare associated infections. So a lot of our work with GP practices around antimicrobial stewardship, antimicrobial resistance, which is a very, very important part of IPC out in the community and something that seems to be forgotten about as well. I think when people think of IPC, the first thought is, oh, it's just about telling people how to wash their hands. But actually, it's so much more than that. It's about public health. It's about making sure that our communities are safe and not just people who are being looked after in a care setting. It's about everyone sitting in this room. It's a huge thing and very important for everyone. I'll hand you back to Jim to find the, to go through the key findings. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, so I really just wanted to kind of summarise what some of the kind of things we found from the various different methods that were used. Uh, there's an awful lot, thank you, Heather, of, of guidance best practice out there. Um, you know, you, you, I, we could have summarised it all and, uh, and, and you could have been here, here all day. But I think, you know, broadly, what all they're trying to achieve is, is to ensure that organisations and staff have the kind of the knowledge, they have the skills, they have the training, the behaviours, the values and the culture. That's really, really important. The support, the monitoring and actually something we really found during COVID, didn't we, was, was leadership. And that was, that's a really, really important element. And that those are the kind of key things that are needed. And I think all of the different best practice documents, toolkits, guidance that are out there, whether international or national, really focus on those sort of areas. From our surveys, I mean, there were lots of positives, but there were a number of opportunities that were identified from surveying. We had, uh, you know, reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, kind of um, uh, sample sizes for those surveys. Enough, I think, to make uh, to make some uh, to, to, for some some insights. There's certainly opportunities for additional training. There's opportunities for increased awareness of training available and for guidance, monitoring of uh, of those IPC behaviours. Many of our care homes use uh, kind of in-house IPC training. That might be excellent, um, but of course we don't really always have that information. And there is obviously regulation by CQC, but really what we want to be as well before there's any kind of issues with CQC, to make sure that they're as prepared as possible for any kind of uh, any threats or issues or, or just regular incidents. Cost and time are barriers for some, certainly general practice and education. And uh, you know, you'll see in, in a couple of slides here that I'll demonstrate that. IPC champion roles are really, really important. It's really important to have a champion. And uh, there's a lot of work gone on with the care homes. And actually that's 
probably one of the excellent things that's come out of the, of COVID that most of them have you know, and know who their champion is. Less common in domiciliary care and general practice, uh, of course, so some potential there. I think one of the things we were a bit worried about in the surveys, and this is not that everyone said this, but a sizable minority said that they, the staff right across said they feel compelled to come into work even if they're unwell with an infection. Maybe some of us are a bit like that as well, um, but maybe it's easier for us, some of us, to, to work from home and hybrid working so you can get away with it. But so it's just trying to manage that, have, have, have a reasonable managed approach. Well, I, I call it infectious presenteeism, but it's, that's my word. It's, uh, but I find it quite useful as, a, as just a kind of encompasses what that approach is. That feel people feel they need to come in to, to look after staff, but actually... You know, it's that balance of harms that we've got to get right there. I think I really wanted just to say there's a huge value placed on the IPC team right across the system. You're, you're really highly respected. Uh, I probably don't, you know, probably it's while I'm saying this, it's hard to say that about itself, but they've seen really highly respected. I think the support they've given the pandemic has really boosted the relationships that we see with all of the care providers and right across the system. So we are really, you know, this is a really opportune time to be to be to be kind of building on all of that from COVID, and actually those relationships between system partners, you know, adult social care colleagues that maybe some of them I didn't know that well before COVID, but we really know well now. Uh, and but right across the system, I think everyone pulled together, and I think there's that sense of solidarity really built some that good kind of communication collaboration. Um, but there really is, a, I think there's a role for support and training in early years, as I said, and I think really what we've got to focus on is capacity building solutions. We can't go into all that. You saw the number. You can't go into every single one every time. You can't go into every school, teach every child. There's got to be ways of building on, 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 on existing assets, existing staff, existing professionals going to care. Can I just, can I just mm. add? Um, just to, sorry, interrupt, Jim. Um, from an education point of view, what we know from our involvement with particularly key stage one, year one children going in to do hand hygiene, we actually put out a flyer to say we would be happy to go in and talk to the children about hand hygiene, cough, cold etiquette, hydration and preventing infections and we were actually inundated to the point the mailbox just collapsed. So and for us as a small team that was a really, really we're kind of a victim of our own success, really. But the, the children and the teachers get so much benefit out of having a healthcare professional going into school. And it's not just about, it becomes not just about teaching the little ones about hand hygiene and IPC. It becomes about being a resource for the teachers as well. Because quite often you'll get asked about different things that the teachers aren't sure of. And also just to um, tag on with what Jim was saying about care homes, care homes will ring us now. So if there's something that they are worried about or they're not quite sure about or there's something that they haven't experienced because we're a face rather than somebody on an e-learning package or a big multinational company providing IPC training, they'll ring us and they'll say, oh, hi, Heather, I've got this problem. What do you think we should do? Do you think you could come out? And it, it makes it a bit more personable. It makes it a, they're, a bit, they're a bit more responsive to IPC concerns. So that is obviously a massive positive that's come from COVID and just been built upon. So I just really wanted to add that. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. And I suppose it's managing those expectations as mm -hmm. well. Isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, just, <laughs> just a couple of examples, mainly to have a couple of pictures and a bit of colour uh, for you, if I'm if I'm honest. But it, you know, in terms of survey of educational settings, you know, they identified some of those barriers as. You know, time, cost, and actually not knowing, that was the biggest one, not knowing what was available. So, you know, a really easy win from an ed education point of view. For GP staff, again, actually about two thirds who responded, of course, in a variety of different roles said they'd had training in the past 12 months. Uh, mainly that was electronic training, as you, as you know, might expect. And then similar kind of barriers as, dom as, as we saw in home care, but actually also some saying, actually, not sure that we necessarily need it. So I think, you know, whether that reflects that actually they have high level of skills, high level of knowledge you know, and, and, and skills and awareness, whether actually that's a, that's a potential, but I think it's certainly worth exploring. Uh, and about two thirds have an IPC champion or lead within the practice. So one bit of work that we did do, just bearing in mind what we're saying, that actually, you know, 
in the ideal world, we'd be able to go into every 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 setting, um, and actually huge opportunities there if we could. But you know, it's not always going to be possible. But we just looked across settings. We said, okay, there's 4.8 whole time equivalent for North Tyneside and Northumberland. If we look across different settings, I haven't got children's residential care there, but 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 this was just a, a you know a kind of testing out an approach. And then the types of work, the prevention, responding to different types of incidents. And if you spread that across, actually, it's quite, a th it's quite thin once you get beyond care homes that are naturally going to take up more than half of the, of the resource. So I think there is a huge opportunity to think about either increasing resource or increasing you know, the kind of capacity and, and how we can build capacity without having to deliver every, everything from the, from the IPC team directly. So our vision really is for all our health, care, education professionals working in the community to have the capability, the opportunity, the motivation to implement IPC measures in their setting, really with a view to protect themselves, but the, the people who, who use the services, people who live there, people who study, people who work there. Like I said, our principles are to have a, have a whole system approach. Whole system approach is going to be the theme of, of, of today, of course. I think it often is. Um, but actually, just to say, recognise it's a finite resource working with partners to think about how we can maximise, uh, you know, and prioritise deployment. But also thinking about, you know, the building the capacity, the resilience within the community, as I've been saying. So there are a number of goals, and we thought, we can't go through all of them. We'll be here forever. So they are available for you to look at, and I think what, what I'm going to come back to uh, is just how we'll report on them. But, uh, you know, Heather's going to talk about just a few of them. I just want to talk a little bit, just an example of, there's one around education. Uh, and actually, you know, we're not going to be able to go into every school, but we have health and safety colleagues who have really good relationships with the health and safety leads within schools. So there's real opportunities to use some of those mechanisms to work with those health and safety colleagues and the council staff into those care homes. And I think we can do that across both councils. So I'm going to hand over uh, back to Heather and then back to me for just one or two slides. Thanks, Jim. Um, just to echo what Jim said about the, the schools and working with health and safety and colleagues, I have done a lot of work with Amanda Young from Northumberland County Council about looking at how we implement that in uh, education settings. But rather than go through all 13 goals, I just thought I'd pick out a couple and just to expand on those. So the first one I picked was the goal number one. So it has the service that we provide from Northumbria Healthcare has to be sustainable. We need to make sure that this is something that can be maintained and it's not just all out and then forgotten about, we burn ourselves out. It needs to be sustainable and it needs to be something that's easy to maintain. And like I alluded to earlier on um, when I spoke, it's about making sure that we are as proactive as possible and prepared as we can be for anything that may come at us in the future. So it's looking at making sure that we're covering all of those key settings in the community where people receive or deliver care to others, whether that's a school, whether it's domiciliary, whether it's a care home, whether it's a GP practice. It's about making sure everyone gets the same service and that there's no areas that are left out. How will we know that, that we've achieved that goal? We'll know that because we live grown the team working predominantly out in the community will have enough staff to be able to go out and provide and maintain that service maintenance and being pro as proactive as possible is absolutely key to this strategy and you know like we've already mentioned we've already been into a number of settings delivering ipc training so there is a need there it's just about how do we maintain it and a lot of that is about growing the team as much as possible Goal number four, training. Again, it's about creating parity, making sure that everybody has the same level of training. And I guess part of that includes agency staff. So we know over the course of the pandemic, we relied a lot on agency staff, whether that was in a school with supply teaching, whether it's in care home with agency staff. And we, we recognise that sometimes that level of training isn't up to the standard that we would want or expect of agency staff or supply staff so we would incorporate those groups into training so that we would be assured 
that all of our staff were receiving the same level of training and we are all coming together from a level playing field, if you like, yeah? And obviously we would record registers about who was trained, when they were trained and would keep those logs up to date and we would report back to assurance groups that X number of staff had been trained and what groups and settings they were working in. And, an and another thing linked to the training would be an e-learning package. So we already contribute to the e-learning package for Northumberland County Council and North Tyneside Council, but it's about making sure that that practice continues so that there is an e-learning package which reflects what you would get face-to-face -face and it's current and it's up-to-date and it reflects our values within Northumberland and North Tyneside. Um, goal five really is about all professional staff. So within Northumbria Healthcare, Northumbria Healthcare staff receive statutory and mandatory training every year as part of their roles and responsibilities. And it's about making sure that everyone who is going into a care setting, whether it's a school, whether you're a school nurse, whether you're a social worker, whatever role you you have, it's about making sure that you will all take responsibility for IPC. IPC is not just about people providing care or people looking after children. It's everyone's responsibility. It's everyone sitting in this room has a responsibility to promote IPC. It's not just about the professionals. It's about the members of the public. It's about making sure that everybody has equal access to health and encouraging the public to think about what they can do to mitigate against spread. I think we've all probably got examples where you've gone into supermarkets and people aren't washing their hands or cleaning trolleys down. Like they were, they were quite fastidious about doing it during the outbreak. And I think now you see people going in and out and they're not washing their hands as well as they were. And it's about making sure that everybody still has IPC at the forefront of the mind and being sensible and keeping that momentum going because like Jim said, potentially, we've got another pandemic not, not that far away. Yeah. So those were really just the main goals that I wanted to pick out. But like Jim said, you've got them all available um, with the strategy as well. I don't know if anyone has any questions about the goals that I've just mentioned. Actually, I'll just finish what I'll do, Heather, if that's right, I'll just yeah. finish to the, the final couple of slides and then be very happy, Chair, if, uh, to take questions. Um, just in terms of reporting, so um, coming back together this month, uh, a, a slash implementation group is going to meet quarterly to, to report on that, those goals and how we'll achieve them uh, and the monitoring framework. And then we'll be reporting to the newly formed Health Protection Insurance Board and, uh, on an annual basis at the minimum more frequently if, if needed to do so. So a thank you obviously to, to Heather, to Chris Woodcock, who, uh, who my uh, counterpart in North Tyneside, and it was, a rep it was shared at their Health and Wellbeing Board last week. Um, and also, of course, to our strategy group members, the stakeholder focus groups, and of course, actually the, uh, the staff within each of those settings who responded to the survey. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim and Heather. Thank you. Very precise but well-explained report and presentation. And I really like the range of activities you are uh, planning to do, the strategy contains education inspection and then a an, uh, root cause analysis. So, so these are extremely important and valuable. We look forward to receiving your reports. Uh, of course, now any questions to Jim and slash or Heather? Yes, Alistair, please. First, I'd thank you. It's a good report. And I think we forget how important some of this is. It, it, and I suspect we're also um, underplaying some of the successes. If I look back, and this is not scientific, but the number of, for example, diarrheal outbreaks in care homes, which can be absolutely devastating uh, for both relatives and obviously the residents, that seems to have dropped off. And that's a real success of, of IPC. So multifactorial and, and some really good work. Uh, the one other comment I wanted to make, and, and it's a shame we don't have anybody from the LMC who should really be raising this, but I believe we've had about 7,000 uh, COVID vaccines in Northumberland as part of the accelerated programme. 
but there is now a real shortage of vaccinations and I understand that uh, at present practices are having to cancel um, clinics simply because of the lack of, of vaccines. Um, simply, uh, I, I think it's not just a local issue, I think it is the fact that, that probably the accelerated programme is slightly outstripping uh, supply of the vaccinations. Um, and it's a shame, I, I think Hillary would have been able to speak on this, which I can't, but it is a, it is a real issue. And I think it's something that uh, I know local primary care feel very sad about because it's definitely, they've actually set things up and, and just simply, and I think some of that might happen this weekend. Just to come back on that point, what we're trying to establish at the moment from an ICB point of view is a real clear mapping of what clinics are happening when and how many patients are booked in in order to establish exactly what vaccine we need in the short term um, in order to not have to cancel clinics. So we are on top of that and that's what we're working through in the next couple of days to tr really try and prevent us cancelling clinics. That's something that we don't want to do and it's a last resort. Um, and hopefully it won't be a cancellation or a postponement because the fact is we've got, we have got vaccine coming into the system daily and weekly and it's building each time. So it's, I think what we need to remember is that we're asking for a huge amount of vaccine, but it doesn't have to be all front ended. We do want the care homes covered off by the end of October. That is still in the plan, but we have got a few weeks to do that. So we may just have to not think of doing everything at once but actually spreading that out across those few weeks so we have got some of it in hand and we're looking as as much as we can to not cancel those clinics so just can i just make a clarification i was recently told in fact my gp contacted me that there's an ongoing program of covid and flu vaccination for certain age groups uh, uh, when you refer to vaccination shortage, are you referring to the ongoing program? Is it? I mean, Dolly's can speak, but but I don't think the supply issues with the flu vaccination. I think it's more with the the COVID vaccination. And obviously, the ideal is to be able to give both vaccines at the same time. It's it's less inconvenient for people, and I think that there's a lot of logic to that. Um, but it's the COVID that I think there are some supply issues with, and I, I agree entirely. This is. You know, no, where nobody wants to be and anything that we can do to avoid this would be, you know, absolutely. Yeah, it's COVID. It's I COVID that's the issue. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd just start by echoing Alistair's comments. I mean, I was stunned by the impact that the team had during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and subsequently, uh, my eyes were open, which is what fantastic work you do. In terms of the strategy and the plan itself, as I read through it, uh, it comes across as a very comprehensive view of what we want to do with the resource within Northumbria for IPC. I just wondered whether we could go a bit further, though, beyond that resource in terms of the plan. And the one thing that we might want to add as an appendix is a more general comms plan. Um, I, I think comms out with of the brilliant work that you did was excellent during and post COVID. I mean, even to daft little things like posters on the back, on the inside doors of toilets and things like that. And I didn't see anything like that in the strategy that I think might be helpful for us to, to flesh out and develop it. That moves beyond the boundaries of what the team can do itself and more into what we can get out there generally to keep the public aware of what's going on. And even within the care home environment, because as you see, you can't get to everybody with only 4.8 staff or whatever it was. Uh, I, I think that would be good to add on to it as an appendix, just to, just to strengthen it a little bit. Yeah, no, thanks, Neil. And uh, I think you ask an entirely justified point. And actually, we have talked about that in the strategy group. And there was a, a working group that was was uh, going to meet to, to, to go through that. And actually, I just spoke to our comms lead today, and they're going to be meeting up as part of this. So it perhaps, um, you know, it's one of those things that you it's not fully formed. So uh, so it's hard to then put in the strategy and I didn't want to delay the strat this strategy coming out because it's something about hitting the, you know, what, you know whilst we have all the goodwill uh, of, of care homes and, other, and education and others, I really just want to, to get cracking with it. But I think you're absolutely right around uh, user care involvement and a kind of wider comms approaches to IPC, I think are really important. And I think we'll definitely take that on board, maybe add that to the kind of final action plan while we move forward. Thank you. Just building on Neil's point a little bit as well, 
it would be possible for us to sit here and say, what a lovely report, thank you very much, sign it off, and then we move on to the next thing in our minds. And I think that's where, being a member of the Health and Wellbeing Board, we should be actually going away back to our organisations and thinking about how do we raise the awareness that there's a strategy that it's been discussed and what's the roles of the organisations in making that happen. Um, and I think there's a lot of times when we do that, we come here and we just kind of, yeah, signed off, done. That shouldn't be what we should be doing. So as members, I think it's a case of show that curiosity, go back and then ask questions of Heather and Jim and say, we reflected on this, can you come and do this? Or how, how can my organisation now engage with you? There's just a quick comment on my previous post. I, I did work a lot in vaccination, and obviously during COVID, there was everybody was involved in that. But um, we, tr I know you've pointed out that practices haven't been so forthcoming with information, but we tried to target practices through um, business continuity plans. So making it everybody's business, like what you're saying, it is everybody's business. IPC is everybody's business, but it actually working with practices to think about who knows about your business continuity plan, who leads on that within your practice, is IPC within your business continuity plan, not just for outbreaks but for, for prevention as well, because obviously that goes into a wider plan around surge, around um, winter plans, uh, all of that is business continuity and IPC is at the forefront of a lot of that. I was just going to say, it, so yeah, a lot of um, primary care practices now have got IPC leads, which is amazing. And we do quite often get phone calls saying, can you give us some ideas about what we can do to implement IPC? And, and it's really it's really good, but it just needs to be across the board and not just the odd one that know about it. And, and like you said, more comms around that so that people know exactly who we are, what we're doing, what we can provide would be great. No, I really appreciate that that, uh, that comment, actually, Lynn, and it'd be great just to link in with yourself and, and maybe Michael Thewlis about maybe how we can just get that information from practices and, 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 yeah. and get that in there, and that can be a catalyst. But I think that, you know, it's also just trying to think about how we can also enable them to have more access to face-to-face -to -face training as well. But yeah. that'd be great. We'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I just want to loop back to the beginning of your presentation when you talked about the timeliness of, of, of this conversation. And I suppose it's partly to um, reassure the board in relation to um, new variants that you're hearing in the news and, and such like that. The best form of protection at this moment in time is infection prevention control and vaccination. None of the other guidance has changed. In, so you might be hearing rumours around testing and PPE. That None of the guidance has changed. We are actively reviewing the situation nationally, but, but the best things we can do collectively is, going back to Graham's point, is all of us owning back into our organisations, preventing infection from happening in the first place by following and adhering to this guidance. So uh, really timely and thank you very much for the presentation. So just to reinforce the point actually Jim thank you for that report um, Jim will know this because Jim sat at our, our health watch board meeting earlier this week when we had a presentation from our comms team so uh, we were talking very much about the sort of both the broadcast and the listening capabilities of the health watch network and we're very happy to work with you as you will well know already to, uh, to spread that very important message. that caught my eyes in your report is that you are commenting on the in, inaccessibility of the quality of uh, in-house IPC training in care homes. What worried me at that time was, you know, during the outbreak, COVID outbreak, last outbreak, there were lots of uh, deaths in care homes and care homes were blaming the government, the government blaming the NHS, you know. I don't know where the truth is. Uh, is it not possible is, is there not an obligation on care homes to make the, what kind of training they do, all the information about the training they do accessible, publicly accessible? Uh, is there any guideline that uh, says this? Why is it that you are unable to assess that quality? Yeah, that's the question. I think a lot of care homes, when we've been going into the care homes, particularly during COVID, there are a lot of 
inequalities in what the training provides. So some training will be very basic mm-hmm. um, and not cover as much as maybe say what we would cover. And th- there are massive gaps and it's it's usually within those homes where they're doing particularly online training. So a lot of the lot of the issues with online training is people will skip to the end. So they'll they'll go on the training and I think you know probably all guilty of that at one stage or another. You skip to you skip to the end and it ticks a box. Whereas having face to face training it's more personable. It you can link it to your place of work, whether that's a care home, whether it's a and it gives them the opportunity to ask questions that you can't ask when you're sat in front of a computer screen. And a lot, I would say a lot of the care homes predominantly use online e-learning for whatever reason, whether it's cost, whether it's just because it's easier than getting X amount of staff in a room on one particular day. I don't know. But when you've got a group of staff work who work in the same place and you've got somebody stood in front of you, it really opens up discussion and it becomes a lot more valuable, the session, because they can, you can think of examples from their setting and it makes it a bit more real for them rather than sitting in front of a computer screen clicking, clicking boxes. Thank you. I understand the problem. I'm yeah. sorry, you want to go ahead, well, Jim, Jim, please. I might just come in if that's all right, uh, Chair. But I, I guess we did do a survey during COVID, actually, and, and under half responded. Mm-hmm. And we didn't really have a way of compelling. Uh, and, and I think it's just, you know, the nature of it's, you know, most is goodwill, isn't it, in terms of it's about good relationships. And that has really, really improved over time. And, and actually, what I don't want to say is that the training is bad. It's just that it's hard to fully understand what the quality of that training is and, and, and clearly not the standard issues that electronic has its barriers and IPC is absolutely fundamental within care homes. Um, I think, you know, CQC do go in, but I just, I always think that's, that's after the horse has bolted, really. If there's a problem, you want it to be nipped in the bud. And, and there's so many different factors. I would defer to Neil, uh, you know, just if there's any, any other issues around a kind of commissioning point of view, whether there's any other levers. But that's something that probably will pick up with Neil's team, you know, further down the line as part of this, the, uh, the, the implementation group meetings. Uh, I mean, just to come in very briefly, Chair, I mean, there are, there are multiple methods that we use to, to, to observe care homes and how they're actually operating. I mean, you mentioned CQC there. And obviously they will have to assure CQC that they're providing a safe environment when they come in to do their inspections. We have a quality function within the commission and team in adults that will go in as well. But ultimately, you often don't find out about something until you're either tipped off about it or something happens. Uh, I mean, COVID was an extreme version of that, obviously, because of the level of infection that was going in. And the homes are ultimately liable for the safety of the clients that they've got within them. Um, but there isn't a perfect solution to this without an infinite number of staff, obviously, to get in every week into a home to be able to mandate training programmes and things like that, which, which simply isn't done at a national level at the minute. Yeah. No, no, I take your point about the electronic barriers, because I used to lecture during lockdown online, and I see lots of screens, you know, on my screen. But most of them I know, students, are not listening. So just to probe, I'll ask Mr. Smith, are you okay? Are you clear? And, and there will be a complete silence, and I could see that the person is not there. Uh, uh, they're virtually there, virtually here, but not there. So, yeah, is the situation changing at the moment? You, that's what you are saying, is that now we can do better, we have better access to the quality of the training and we, we were able to assess it. That's, that's what I'm asking. Is it changing? Uh, I, I mean, I, th- I think there's been an awful lot of learning from COVID itself. And, yes. and we look at things more closely now than we probably did pre-COVID because they hadn't exploded as an issue in the same way as they did during COVID. So use of PPE, generally the training, how infection con- prevention control works within the home and things like that. And working with the, the team at Northumbria have been instrumental in that. Um, but, but you will have variations in quality across different homes and at different times we'll push more resource into some homes where we think there may be issues that we need to help them with to, to try and improve. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, then thank you very much.
So can I propose that uh, we sign off this strategy? Thank you. Thank you very much. The next one is uh, a presentation by our talk by uh, Healthy Weight or Un Unhealthy Weight Alliance. And again, it will be introduced by Veronica Jones. So um, each year, the Director of Public Health produces a, an annual report focusing on one specific topic. In 1921-22, the topic was on healthy weight for all children. And one of the recommendations from that report was the establishment of a health and well-being alliance. Um, no, I'm sure that's healthy weight alliance. Um, it was recommended. Um, so the Joint Health and Wellbeing Board strategy is currently being refreshed to reflect the Marmot principles and to help deliver Northumberland's inequalities plan. So this report um, is to update board members on progress, provide feedback on the workshop held in May, and to seek agreement that the Northumberland Health and Wellbeing Alliance reports to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Personally, I'm really pleased about the establishment of the Alliance, bringing all involved together and making sure we've got a coordinated approach to healthy weight. And I hope you're going to agree to the recommendation. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Jones. And I think that's a really good overarching summary of what we're going to be proposing today. And, and we're going to almost move straight to questions now. You've done, done my job for us. Thank you. I think um, just, just building on some of the things that Councillor Jones has, has touched upon, um, the DPH annual report from, from the previous year from our outgoing director of public health, uh, Liz Morgan, covers healthy weight for all um, for all ages, but specifically focuses on, on children and young people and specifically focuses on, on four really key areas, and that's healthy weight in the home, healthy weight in communities, healthy weight in schools, and healthy weight in healthcare, um, and proposes a series of recommendations across those four areas about what we can do as a system to be, to be able to support children and young people to achieve and maintain, which is really important, um, healthy weight. It looks to recognise the strengths of, of what we've got, which is some really, really good networks that were built up pre-COVID and build up what's strong. And one of the recommendations, as Councillor Jones mentions, is the formation of a, of a Healthy Weight Alliance. This is a process that was started pre-pandemic, but unfortunately um, work was, was paused because it was only, we were unable to, to, to get stakeholders all in, in one room. Um, and I think it's really timely that we, we now come back and, and progress the, the work that was started. Um, just with regards to the, the purpose of the report and, and the recommendations, I just want to outline what those are. I'm sure everybody's had the opportunity to read the report. If not, um, hopefully you've got it in front of you. Um, but the purpose of the report is to update board members on the progress with regards to the Northumberland Healthy Weight Alliance, to feed back on the Healthy Weight Alliance workshop that we've just, just held in May 2023, including some of the suggested priority areas, to inform board members of the appointment of a Healthy Weight Alliance champion or, or chair who will chair meetings going forward, and to seek the, the agreement of the Northumberland Healthy Weight Alliance reports to the Health and Wellbeing Board, really for that, that governance and the, and the scrutiny um, that will progress work and, and be held accountable. And the recommendations contained within the, within the report are we approve the establishment or the board approves the establishment of a healthy weight alliance which brings together agencies and communities to ensure a coordinated approach to healthy weight, to agree that the Northumberland Healthy Weight Alliance reports to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and to delegate responsibility of the Healthy Weight Alliance to deliver the Healthy Weight Declaration which the Health and Wellbeing Board signed off um, in November 2022. Um, I just want to quickly build on, on on some of the, the background information that was contained within that, that report. And I think it, it's really timely just to revisit um, what was then Liz's messages around, around healthy weight. Um, and those in summary were, nearly a third of children aged two to 15 are overweight or obese and younger generations are becoming obese earlier and staying obese for longer. Two thirds of adults in Northumberland are overweight or obese with those from lower income households much more likely to fall into this category compared 
to people from higher income households. Excess weight is a significant health issue for all ages, contributing to both physical and mental ill health, a reduced number of years spent in good health and reduced life chances. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the association between health inequalities, chronic disease and obesity as risk factors, it's important for Northumberland to build back better, providing healthier places, reducing inequalities and building resilience into recovery plans as part of the prevention agenda. The current cost of living crisis is placing additional strain on household budgets as prices of essentials such as food and fuel increase, with low-income families may turn to cheaper foods, cheaper processed foods, often with little nutritional value with access to a range, access to a range of healthy, affordable foods, resulting in diet-related inequalities and widening of health disparities. Promoting healthy weight is even more important amidst the cost of living crisis to reduce pressure on health and social care systems, promoting well-being and quality of life, and ensuring a productive workforce and a healthy economy. And within the local authority, we have the potential to impact on, as well as wider stakeholders on almost all of the above. Um, and I want to come on to, on to, on to what we're doing as a, as a healthy weight alliance um, and progress to date, if that's, if that's all right. So in May 2023, we picked up the work that we'd started pre-pandemic around Public Health England's whole systems approach to tackling obesity. And we held our first Healthy Weight Alliance workshop with over 45 or almost 45 delegates from a range of, um, of occupations, mainly with strategic leadership roles within their, their organisations. Um, and we focused the, the purpose of that workshop around the five key strategic goals that are, that are contained, you knew that was going to come, um, that are contained within the, the, healthy weight, the local authority healthy weight declaration. And those are our system leaderships, the commercial determinants of health, promoting health, healthy environments, system and cultural change, and, and healthy weight across the life courts. And what we mean by all these system leadership is adopting a long-term system-wide approach to healthy weight, the commercial de determinants of health, promoting healthy weight, uh, sorry, healthy food and drink options, while also protecting our residents against the harmful effects of inappropriate marketing, often sponsorship from the food and drink industry, promoting healthy environments, so ensuring where we live has a positive impact um, on our health and has uh, physical activity, active travel, and the food and drink environment and food security are things that we we'll prioritise and promote. System and cultural change, so how organisations that often we're all, all part of, um, you know, create a culture and an ethos to promote and a better understanding of healthy weight and healthy weight across the life course. So a life course approach that supports healthy weight um, of both future, of both current and future generations. And we asked ourselves three key questions as, as, as part of this exercise. What key areas of, of, of work look like and, and where might we focus our attention? How will we know what success looks like and how will we measure it? And also, what, who are the key organisations and, and key people that need to be involved? As part of the paper, I've attached the appendix, which you can all um, have a look at, and you'll see that there's a whole host of information that we collected as, as part of the workshop. But I just want to highlight three key priorities that were identified as cross-cutting themes across all of the tables and conversations that, that we had. Number one was the development of a, of a food, food strategy for Northumberland, um, not just a food poverty strategy. It was really important that um, partner feedback included things on food growth, food procurement, minimising waste, which obviously contributes to the Council's and other organisations' carbon reduction strategies. Design and development of where we live to maximise access to healthy foods and being physically active. So making sure that active modes of transport and travel are prioritised over motorised methods of transport. And giving every child the best start in life, so utilising some of our assets with family hubs um, to promote good nutrition in early years, such as breastfeeding and infant feeding, and making sure that where we've got things like the Healthy Start Voucher Scheme, we'll maximise an uptake so pregnant women and young mums have got access to fruit and vegetables for, for, for newborns. With regards to, to next steps, um, as I mentioned before, you'll see in Appendix 1 that there's a whole host of information contained in, in that appendix. We host, we're planning to host uh, a, a second workshop just to feedback what we found in Workshop 1 
um, and, and feedback our, priori our priority areas to system partners. As mentioned in the in the in the earlier priorities and the and the outcomes, of, uh, sorry, the out objectives of today, that will be chaired by Paul Jones, who's who's kindly agreed to chair and champion the Healthy Weight Alliance, um, and then it'll be on the, the formation of the Healthy Weight Alliance. Clearly, 45 delegates um, it, it is absolutely fantastic, but we need to slim that down in, into a, into a, you know what is a delivery group? Who's going to drive the Healthy Weight Alliance forward? On, on a smaller scale, but as we mentioned before, um, just be accountable to, to the Health and Wellbeing Board. So the paper, and I've lost that, three, um, just has three options, and the options are um, to adopt the recommendations that we've outlined in, in section three of the report, to consider the governance and delegated responsibilities of the Healthy Weight Alliance and suggest alternative arrangements, or, and hopefully not, to reject the recommendations but with a clear rationale for non-adoption non of the recommendation and we propose that that um that of all of the above we opt for option option one um happy to take any questions thank you very much uh, really thank you uh, are there any questions yeah. <coughs> I'm in danger of thinking out loud, which is potentially a problem. Um, Veronica mentioned our refresh of the health and wellbeing strategy, and within your report, you mention a lot about system working and the system responsibility. So it's really just bringing it back round to make that our system creates the environment to operationalise what these task groups wish to do. And that brings us right back to the work that we're doing in the communities and the inequalities work and how we do the asset-based, strength-based work. Um, because if we're talking about an environment that makes it a healthy, happy life, our place-based tool should be telling us where we should be focusing some of the work, but what does the community need in terms of being more active and doing these things. So it's, it's one of the first things that is starting to come round in a cycle when we started to think about how we do the inequalities work, which gives us something really tangible to work with, I think. So it's really timely, so thank you. Thanks, David. I think as we, uh, the Healthy Weight Alliance develops and is aligned to the Healthy Weight Declaration that we've all signed up with alongside Northumbria Healthcare Trust and North Tyneside Council, there's probably something for me around short, medium and longer term goals because the danger is we could probably provide something quite similar in a year's time to say these are the issues and we're sort of working on these areas. So I, I know we're very keen in the refresh of the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy to be a lot more tangible and to, and to really emphasise that, that the shorter term changes that are possible. As an example, you made reference to the Healthy Start vouchers. That's something quite tangible that we've got the data on. We know what proportion uh, are currently eligible and what, uh, sorry, we know the population eligible and we know the population that's actually taking it up at the minute. We can see that change within a year if we do that um, active piece of work as opposed to changing an environment which is all about planning and neighbourhood change. So I think what would be really helpful for the board next time if, if it is indeed agreed for us to be the governance structure for the Healthy Weight Alliance is to see some tangible changes in a year and where the process structural stuff is starting to happen at longer term as well. Sorry, Chair. Can I can I just come back on that? Jill, I, I obviously completely agree. And I think one of the longest term goals that we'll have is to change the built environment because we know that that'll, that'll take the greatest deal of time. What I want to add is, is that we're not starting from scratch. A lot of the work that we've been doing, even even pre-pandemic, which, which um, colleague Jim Brown started with the, the planning team here in the local authority, is looking at what we can do to try and help shape the environment. And, and Jim worked very closely with planning colleagues on our hot food takeaway policy. Um, which looks to try and minimise the number of hot food takeaways we've got in, in a given area um, because we know that you know access to unhealthy foods is one of the things that has got within the position that we are with with regards to levels of unhealthy weight um, and obesity. Um, and we've also worked with planning colleagues on, on what we're calling our healthy planning checklist. So, so this is um, 
scrutiny of developments that are coming into the local authority to be built and, and what can we do um, to make that development as healthy as possible you know is it connected to the to the nearest local um, neighboring dwellings by motor, by non motorized methods of transport um, and just this week actually we've had our first healthy planning checklist uh, development come in for a wider scrutiny um, which will be done through inequalities impact assessment so that's our opportunity to try and, and, and help shape the environment. So it's testament to colleagues who, who've already got one this journey, um, but also testament to colleagues in planning who've adopted that public health approach and are now supporting the wider public health system. Thank you, David. So that's, that's exactly what I was going to ask about. We, you know, it reminded me of this uh, Northumberland food strategy, which we are formulating and trying to get it approved. That's that's what the, you, you, you mentioned, healthy food strategy or something. Okay, thank you very much. So it is on the angle. Okay. Are there any questions? Try in that case, David, thank you very much. Sir? Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, can, may I propose we accept the recommendations, three recommendations on page 62. We approve the establishment of the alliance, uh, not the, and then the alliance will report to this board periodically and uh, give them the responsibility to deliver the healthy weight declaration. Is that okay? May I propose? Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last major item is a report on with you in mind. May I invite uh, Anna to come forward. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Thank everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Foster. I'm the Trust Lead for Strategy and Sustainability at Cumbria, Northumberland, Tynewyr, NHS Foundation Trust. And um, apologies from my colleague, Shree McCartney, who was going to be joining me today um, in, pre in presenting our strategy, but unfortunately she's ill and couldn't join us. So um, you'll see there's a paper in the pack introducing our new strategy. Um, I'm going to take you through a brief presentation as well. Um, and I believe you have a copy of the strategy itself, um, which has been developed over the last couple of years, working closely uh, with our stakeholders, with our service users and carers, our staff and our partners, um, and under the leadership of our new chief executive, James Duncan, um, who's now um, leading the organisation. It's really hard to summarise a strategy um, into one sentence, um, but really, our strategy in CNTW is to build relationships and to make decisions based on what matters to people. We wanted a strategy that was really meaningful um, and have tried very hard to write it in a way um, that connects us to our purpose. So um, you'll see in the paper as a reminder that at Cumbria Northumberland Tyne and where we're a, a large organisation spanning uh, North Cumbria, Northumberland, North Tyneside, North Newcastle, Gateshead, Sunderland, the South Tyneside, and we provide some regional and uh, national services as well. We have a workforce of 9,000 people. And we really wanted to write this as a strategy that, um, that was appropriate for all of the services that we provide and all of our staff as well. So uh, we are sometimes described as a mental health trust, but we're more than a mental health trust. We provide uh, a range of services. Um, it's included in the paper that is in front of you. Um, but we provide services uh, to support the mental well-being of all of our populations, but specifically services as well to people with a learning disability, uh, people who are autistic or have other neurodivergence. Um, we support people with neuro neurodevelopmental conditions um, and neurodisabilities, should I say, sorry, from a Walker Gate Park base in Newcastle, which is, um, which is a bit different. We uh, provide secure services as well. Um, we provide those from our unit uh, here in Morpeth, and there's a new unit opening sh shortly as well. Um, and we have another unit in Morpeth as well. Um, and we also provide some services for people with problematic substance use or addictive behaviours. Um, and we don't want to do uh, all those people a disservice by just referring to ourselves as a mental health trust. 
Uh, but back to the strategy. Um, so like I say, our strategy really is about uh, relationship centre practice, building relationships um, and making decisions based on what matters to people. I've pressed the wrong button. So I wanted to mention five things um, really to note um, about our new strategy um, before going into it into a bit more detail. And we've worked really hard to ensure that people and their needs are at the heart of this strategy. And what we want from this strategy is it's the, the type of strategy that as well as being able to come and talk to you, uh, health and wellbeing boards and in our board and making, making the big strategic decisions around the future of the organisation, it's also about influencing the small everyday decisions that all of our staff make every day. Um, so that's about influencing culture as well. And in our strategy, we've been really honest about the need for change as well um, across um, where we are, our role within the health and care system and, our, and how we work with partners um, to improve the mental well-being of our populations. And because of that, we know we cannot do this alone. We have to work in partnership. So this is a strategy about working together. And lastly, it is, it is written as a guide rather than a blueprint because we provide 200 different services and it would be difficult to write something that um, set out exactly what we plan to do on each of the next five years for each of our services. So really, uh, yeah, please consider this more of a guide um, that we're working to as an organisation. We started off um, this journey a couple of years ago by um, an engagement piece, which at the time was called CNTW 2030, so people may have been involved in that at the time. Uh, where we ask the same questions of all of our stakeholders, so whether people are service user or, or member of staff or a partner. Um, we wanted to keep it broad, so we asked some really open questions, basically around what matters to you um, and what must we protect, how would you like us to work together and what would make the biggest difference to you. And what we heard um, from that piece of work uh, was some, we boiled down into four key themes. Um, and these were universal across the board rather than splitting them down into different stakeholders. We heard about um, uh, that collectively we want to have an imp a positive impact on people's well-being. Um, there were some shared principles that emerged um, around protecting people's human rights, for example. Um, our staff in particular said that, you know, we want to be able to do the best job we can and make it easy for us to do the best job we can um, so that we can provide the best care. Um, and, um, and there was an overwhelming sense of wanting to work together to meet the needs of people and communities. Um, so that exercise took a couple of iterations where we went back out um, and, and, um, and checked that what we'd heard was what people had said. Um, and that took a bit of time, but we wanted to get it right. Um, so from that, we developed our new strategy, which comprises three parts. So the first part of our strategy really uh, uh, summarises what people want from us and we've turned those into a set of commitments which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. The middle part of our strategy is about what binds us as an organisation and that contains our vision and our values and the last part of our strategy is about what we want to achieve collectively and we have five strategic ambitions. So our commitments have been broken down into four sets of commitments um, and they've been written as I statements so from a personal perspective. Um, and this is what we know we're not necessarily achieving every day at the moment, but we want to get there. We want to get to the point where we're mostly achieving these. So in terms of our commitment to service users, the kind, I'll not read them all out, but the, to give you a flavour, the kind of things um, that we reflected back in our strategy from what we'd heard are that as a service user, um, what's really important to service users is to feel understood and that they've had, um, their story has been heard, but they don't have to keep retelling their story. Um, and that, um, that we work together to understand a person's strengths, needs and risks. Um, and that their rights and their choices and their freedoms are protected. Um, people want to feel respected. Um, and people really want to form trusted relationships with the people um, who are supporting them and caring for them. Um, and also that their family and carers are supported while someone's unwell as well. And that we respond quickly if someone's unwell or in crisis. Um, and as a separate piece of work that have been going on at the same time. There'd been a separate piece of work with our carers and they had independently come up with a set of commitments as well, a carer's promise, which was actually very similar to what we'd heard from service users. So we have a carer promise and we have a commitment to our staff as well. So uh, from a, particularly from a staff perspective, this um, what staff told us was similarly about needs 
So you'll see there's a theme through all these commitments about meeting needs. Uh, so staff also want to feel trusted and respected and valued and to be treated fairly. Um, they want to have freedom to act, um, to be able to use their judgment, their clinical judgment, and to be free to innovate. Um, they want to protect their time. Uh, this was a big theme in terms of spend, clinicians really want to spend their time on meaningful interactions and on caring, um, rather than some of the less value-adding tasks that maybe they're asked to do. So that's a, um, a commitment from us to look at all of our systems and processes to make life easier for staff. Um, staff really want to get the right balance between work and home as well and have flexible working opportunities. Um, and people are looking for meaningful work, they need to be safe at work, and they need to feel they have a voice and they're supported. And then lastly, um, and quite pertinent to the Health and Wellbeing Board as well as uh, we, we're making a commitment to our partners and communities as well as a result of what we've heard through our engagement. Um, so we want to be really clear what people can expect from CNTW and this is part of that. Um, um, and and we, we all want to work together to fight illness and unfairness and stigma. Unfortunately, there is still some things are getting better, but still some stigma around uh, mental health um, and some of the other areas that we um, support. Uh, we want to share responsibility for getting things right, really get to know local communities, be responsible with our public funds um, and share our buildings and our grounds and land um, and protect, protect planet as well, work in a way um, that doesn't increase our carbon footprint and hopefully reduces it. So there are our commitments um, and um, we're embarking on a programme of really uh, uh, talking with our staff to understand those commitments because um, those commitments will help guide the decisions that we make every day. Uh, it can help us to think, well, is this decision in line with meeting those commitments? Does it help us to meet those commitments or not? So hopefully it simplifies things to a certain degree. Um, but we also have five uh, strategic ambitions uh, which you can read about in the strategy. So one is around quality care every day. So that's where we want to start to bring in uh, some of our ambitions, for example, around developing our services so that they are trauma-informed and, in fact, that we become a trauma-informed organisation, for example, um, that we deliver personalised care, um, that we really work to the principles of triangle of care, which is making sure that carers are involved um, in, the, in, um, in working with service users um, and other quality principles and that staff are able to feel that they're able to innovate and that we prioritise research as well as an organisation. There's a second strategic ambition around person-led care, where and where it is needed, and that goes through um, those seven different areas that I outlined earlier in terms of the people we support, and it sets out a vision for each of those. And we want to be a great place to work um, and to attract staff and to retain staff uh, into our workforce, and so we have a strategic ambition about how we will um, uh, do that. And we want to be sustainable for the long term, innovating every day, and that's where we're going to think really carefully um, and we'll have enabling strategies to support all of these. Um, but that's what we'll bring in. Well, how can we use technology to support us in the future? How are we using our estates? Um, and how will we uh, be financially sustainable as well? Um, and lastly, a uh, strategic ambition around working with and for our communities um, and making sure that we are uh, not trying to work in isolation because we know that doesn't work and we can only deliver this together by working in partnership. There's a couple of extra slides here, um, which uh, my colleague Shereen McCartney would have been able to tell you much more detail on, so apologies, I won't be able to give the detail, but we know uh, that colleagues are interested uh, in particular in the community mental health transformation uh, that is um, taking place across the entire region and nationally as well. Um, so I can give you a flavour on this, this part of it. Um, uh, but this is uh, where we're working um, uh, on a transformation strategy um, to really try and prevent people when they're mentally unwell from coming into hospital um, and being treated uh, in the community and being able to stay well in the community as well. Um, and that, so that requires a big shift um, and a lot more partnership and community working. Um, so there are seven place-based community transformation programmes across the ICB area, um, and that's chaired in Northumberland uh, by Sonia McGough. Um, and each place-based area is taking an approach slightly differently because they, they need to come up with um, place-based solutions to community mental health and thinking about how all, how all of the different partners will work together um, to work in a much more integrated way in communities. Um, 
So in, we have an annual plan which supports our strategy and we have a strategic objective this year around improving community mental health services for adults and older people. Um, so the, um, the strategic objectives for that from us um, are delivering the ambitions of our primary care strategy and uh, apologies for the acronym, but including the R's roles, uh, which is some joint roles uh, which are working quite successfully um, that have been introduced in the last few years as part of the NHS long-term plan to have mental health workers embedded within primary care. Uh, we want to share learning and understand local variation across those seven place-based programmes. Um, we do need to meet access and waiting time standards um, while ensuring that we're delivering safe, effective evidence-based care. Um, so that's a key priority from us. Um, and we want to move away from the care programme approach. This is a national uh, initiative as well. Um, to something that is much more co-produced and personalised care and support plans that works best because there's a national recognition that the care programme approach um, isn't particularly working. Um, and that's the end um, of the presentation. Um, in the paper, um, there's a recommendation that the board note our strategy and, and, um, and the ethos that we're really trying to convey through our strategy and trying to work to. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Are there any questions for Anne? Sorry, it's a very sensible strategy. I think at the beginning you said it's an aspirational thing. We know that we aren't there yet. This is where we want to get to. So I would just say, yes, work with us. Specifically around Northumberland, I think one of the issues, I guess, for you, which I'd be keen to hear comments on, is the fact that you cover many different places. Mm. So as an organisation that does that across the North East, to actually get to know communities feels like a challenge for your organisation unless you have people who are particularly responsible for that area and the leadership and the culture in that area. Because I suspect how things are done in the culture in different places is different across the North East. Mm -hmm. So as a corporate organisation, to mould yourself to different cultures from a leadership team must be a challenge. Yeah. So... I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, and that is the way that we are structured currently, um, is that we are um, uh, locality-based in terms of um, how we're organised. Um, so we have different, uh, four different localities, one for North Cumbria, uh, one for the North, which is Northumberland and North Tyneside combined, um, a central one, we call central, which is Newcastle and Gateshead, and then the south, we call south, where, where these are different from the categories of the ICB, <laughs> um, which for us is Sunderland and South Tyneside. And absolutely, um, it is about local leadership. And our approach to that um, is having a devolved leadership um, uh, approach where we have um, le uh, leaders who have got the responsibility and accountability to work with their local partners and have got the authority to adapt their services to meet the needs of the local community. And it is a challenge getting the balance right between spend, people spending their time out externally and working with partners as leaders and then and also working internally uh, to develop services. But in a devolved structure, that's absolutely the expectation that we have of our local leadership teams. Thank you. And, and just to put it in context of, of the whole in relation to mental health and well-being, um, just to note for, for partners in the November board meeting, we will have a public mental health update because I think it's important we see the context of, of, of where CNTW sits as an organisation and, and, and treatment and, and then how we work on that preventative and early intervention uh, across the life course as well. So I think that might be quite timely and, and hopefully we've got a strong CNTW representation for, for that particular conversation in November board Thank you. <coughs> yes, I think, uh, this is uh, very timely too because we have been getting reports in the past I think from the coroner there are lots of ri there's a rise in uh, mental health issues mm -hmm. uh, among the youth mm -hmm. so this is very timely so we welcome to your input yeah. all the best with your uh, strategy for ethos and everything so may I propose we have noted the ethos and strategy uh, with you in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, that uh, takes us to the seventh item in the agenda, forward plan, as you may know or recall. 
we have been revising our uh, health and well-being strategy for a while. We started off with the Liz Morgan, and then there are lots of turbulence in now, and then now it has come under Jill. I think we have got a complete grip on the whole thing. There are four pillars in the strategy, and uh, e for each of the four pillars, there's going to be a report discussed in this uh, uh, board, and um, th they will be discussed in pairs in the next uh, in uh, October and November. So your input, there are lots of hard work and um, uh, uh, inputs have gone on, so your suggestions and uh, uh, comments will be very welcome. Okay, in the next one. So if you have any other items to be discussed, I think you can email me or Jill or Leslie, please. Urgent business, I have none. Uh, and uh, please note the date of next meeting is on 12th of October. 2023 at 10 year. Thank you very much for all of you to come here. Thank you.